So Team Reagan drew the Allies together at the Plaza Hotel in New York and says, look, we see what you've been doing. You're going to stop. You're going to stop today. Because if you don't, the Americans will withdraw from the global order and you can deal with the energy markets and the Soviet Union by yourself because we got a side deal. Now, Lighthizer was assigned to the Japanese to make sure they didn't renege on the deal because the intimidation worked. Currency manipulation didn't stop, it reversed. The US dollar dropped by half. And while Lighthizer was in Tokyo, he'd get his marching orders from the White House. He'd walk into the Ministry of Finance and lay out the American position. And then when it was the Japanese's turn to issue the rebuttal, he'd actually take off his translator microphone, disassemble it on the desk in front of them, and have a little G.I. Joe war with the pieces while they spoke. You know, when they'd finished, he'd scoop it back together, put it on his ear, say, well, that was riveting. I hope somebody really wrote that down, but we're going to do it my way, right? He makes sure he holds all the cards and that he's got backing from his boss, and then he forces the issue. This is the guy in charge. Quick walk around the world so you know where we stand. The first trade deal that was modified were the Koreans. President Moon of South Korea was smart enough to realize that there is no version of a world without the United States in it in which his country continues to exist. His country is trade dependent, and from a security point of view, if it's not North Korea, it's China or Japan. It's a tough neighborhood. So at his first opportunity, Moon walked into the White House and says, you don't like our bilateral trade deal. Okay, how do we change it so that you do? The technical talks were over in six weeks. Is it enough to keep the Americans involved the day that American troops are needed? Moon doesn't know. Trump doesn't know. I don't know. Nobody knows. But without the modification to the chorus deal, the answer would have been absolutely not. Next up were the Mexicans. Now, on the left there, you've got Enrique Peña. He's the outgoing leader. He is, from an American point of view, the best partner we could have ever had in Mexico City. Fluent English speaker, pro-trade, pro-business, wanted deals on migration, cooperation against the cartels, breathlessly corrupt. He was just the perfect partner. <laughs> he would call up Obama, and Obama wouldn't pick up the phone. He would call Trump and only get insults. Hideous series of wasted opportunities. The new guy, that's Lopez Obrador, AMLO. He's, wow, he's fun. He combined the political corruption of Hillary Clinton and the anti-foreigner sentiment of Donald Trump and the shrillness of Elizabeth Warren and the blind ideology of Ted Cruz and the pathological refusal to do basic mathematics of Bernie Sanders, just all in one guy. <laughs> Megalomaniac. And he looks at Trump and he's like, it's like looking in a mirror. Therein is light and opportunity. Say what you will about AMLO. He was smart enough to realize that if he got in a pissing contest with Donald Trump, it would consume his presidency. And he sees himself as the Mexican equivalent of Bill Clinton, a leader of national renewal. He didn't want that. So after his election, but before his inauguration, he called the White House and he called Pena, conferenced them together and says, look, if you two guys can figure out the next iteration of NAFTA, Get it signed before I take over. I give you my word, I will personally spearhead ratification. It worked. He's proved to be an honest broker. The Mexicans ratified the deal over the summer, the Americans and the Canadians, in December. It's done. Trump actually signed it today. All right, we're somewhere warm, so there have got to be Canadians here. Where are you? Come on, show me my Canadians. All right, a bunch of you. Yeah, security in California sucks. <laughs> uh, this is Christina Freeland. She's the Canadian Deputy Prime Minister. She's the second most powerful person in the country. She used to be Foreign Minister. She got kicked upstairs with the last elections. Now, in my opinion, Minister Freeland is one of the 10 smartest people in Western civilization today. Four years ago, I beat her in a debate but we're not here to compare records. Freeland's biggest advantage, I think, is she knows how to keep her ego in check, which for a politician is kind of a big deal. 
Now, she became foreign minister the week that Donald Trump became president. And because she's the foreign minister of Canada, her first big meeting with a foreign leader was with Trump. And she realized not five minutes into that first encounter that she was absolutely the wrong person for the job. So everyone has their own personality quirks. Tom's biggest one is that he feels he must be the smartest person in any given room. And as long as Minister Phelan was in the same time zone, that was never going to happen. So she knew that she had to step back for managing day-to-day -day foreign affairs with the United States. She couldn't be the face of the relationship. She needed someone else to put in front, someone with a nice smile and a great head of fear in a tight outfit and a tighter body. Somebody who just stand there and note and smile. But somebody who has completely unbonded by having anything going on between their ears. And she found the perfect person. Justin Trudeau is by far Donald Trump's favorite world leader because he's not allowed to speak. He just stand there and notes and smile. And Donald Trump in turn monology fills in all the gaps and it's very complimentary the Canadians call it the hug offensive you know how Canadian is that it was working great until a little over a year ago when the Canadians had the honor of hosting the Z7 summit and has host Justin Trudeau had to speak and for the first time in the term administration the inner monology did not match the sound waves relation literally collapsed in an hour now when the americans would go down to mexico city for the trade talks for nepta 2 we talk about rules and of origin we would talk about the digital economy and agriculture subsidies well the real issues but when time light hyzer would come up to canada they had a look at the agenda. Today we are talking about the worker rights of left-handed handicap transvestites. What the fuck? The Canadians were styling. Now, why would the Canadians think that styling with this administration at this time in this political climate was even remotely a good idea? Well, to be blunt, it's because they had a really good route on how American-Canadian relations had been for the last 70 years. And it all has to do with this map. Canada is on the fight path for Soviet nuclear powers on the way to the United States. Which means there was never any version of ca Canadian, excuse me, there's never any version of American security during the Cold War, in which Canada was not perfect for free, so the Canadians just had leverage, like no one else in the world. Now, to their credit, they didn't use this to free ride on security issues. They did the opposite. Whenever there was an international crisis, the Canadian Prime Minister was always the first world leader to pick up the phones, call the American President and say, we see what's happening, we are here, we are with you, how can I help you? Okay, thank you for watching Geopolitics Research.